by SMAS WorkSafe. We had an overview of Yukata and um, the various types of uh, training that they had available and an overview. The second webinar which we hosted was widely attended and it covered duty to manage and where the responsibility lays when managing asbestos in buildings. Today we look at the interesting topic of asbestos in soils and made ground. Historically, the widespread use of asbestos, poor waste management and demolition practice has resulted in asbestos containing material being present in soil or made ground at many brownfield and in some cases greenfield sites. Um, today on our panel, uh, we have Marcus, who is our technical director. Um, I see he's not up in presenter, so I will search for him in, in the attendees list and push him up. Marcus is here uh, to answer any questions that you may have health and safety related after the presentation. Um, he is responsible for our preferred supplier compliance in areas to include health and safety, quality and environmental. He also manages our in-house team of assessors to ensure that we consistently meet our obligations to the SSIP. Professor Roger Woolley is an eminent academic and successful business who is highly respected throughout the health and safety asbestos industry. Even though his training, research and consultancy work is in great demand both nationally and internationally, he still gives of his time freely to speak at high profile events on behalf of Yukata. Roger has been involved as a Yukata director for many years and his clear thinking approach to board discussions is highly respected by all. He is known affectionately as the wise owl on the board <laughs> director, a term which befits him well. <laughs> Should you have any questions um, that you would like to put to our presenter or panel member, please present them on the chat and then we will run through them at the end of presentation. I will now hand you over to our presenter, Professor Roger Wiley. Thank, Thank you, Trish. You. Okay, will, will this automatically come up in full screen? Um, yes, you can just go ahead now. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, folks. I'm very, very pleased to hear so many people in the room. Uh, a little bird told me that Mavis Nye is in the room today. So good afternoon, Mavis. I do hope you're well, and I do hope your charity is flourishing. And hopefully you can get a few more contributions after after today's uh, webinar. Uh, that's me there. Uh, my name's Roger. I think it's very pretentious to have all these things behind your name. So usually I don't put it there. I am known in some circles within IOSH and uh, within Yukata as ARGE, and that stands for All Round Good Egg. And basically, that's all you need to know. Uh, I've been doing this for rather a long time now. I founded the first asbestos test house in Scotland in 1978. Uh, it was one of the first in the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, I was still working at the university then. And uh, marching through the academic ranks. So I was doing consultancy work, measurement work, training, a lot of research work, and you'll see a little part of it just now. And I think we've probably been involved in, uh, in most of the big asbestos decisions and legislation for the last 40 years, really. And on top of that, uh, I get involved as an expert witness in legal services, and we've done about, I've done about 600 cases at the moment. Uh, in terms of asbestos contracts, well over 150,000 altogether, absolutely all over the world. And at the moment, uh, I should have been in Santiago in Chile uh, last week and this week to escape from the snows here. But of course, there are no flights. Uh, 
Uh, so we're helping the Chilean government. They have no legislation at the moment. So we're helping them to set up legislation and helping them to set up the first ever asbestos test house in Chile, as indeed we did in Turkey two or three years ago and in Japan a few years before that and so on and so on. And so, on. so we've been involved in most things particularly in contaminated land. Before I came along, there were no rules, there were no regulations, there was no guidance from the Health and Safety Executive, nothing at all. So <clears throat> the presentation will talk a little bit about brownfield sites, so contamination. I'll talk you through the first ever major uh, asbestos soil project in the UK, which was 1986. And I think you'll find it very interesting. I can't say uh, any of the technical details because it's covered by the Official Secrets Act. So I'll go on to talk then about the third biggest job in the UK. We didn't do the first one, uh, second, we did the first and the third. And I'll talk in some detail about working protocols and I'll end up by talking about training required and how UCATA can help you to uh, become properly trained. So that's the programme from now until about eight o'clock tonight. We'd stop at four o'clock for a cup of tea, okay? Right, the brownfield sites. There's a real shortage now in the UK for of virgin land, the greenfield sites, a real, real shortage, especially here in the west of Scotland. We were central to the Industrial Revolution, of course, the first industrial revolution the world had ever seen, and we had the biggest shipyards in the world. So all the greenfield sites were used up for shipyards and associated rope factories, engine factories, and so on. So if you want to build in the west of Scotland, there is no greenfield sites. There are no sites available. So you'll have to use a brownfield site. In other words, a piece of land that has been used previously. And certainly where I live and where I work, that land will be contaminated. It could be contaminated from the demolition of buildings, uh, a lot of the shipyards, the owners, simply locked the gates on a Friday afternoon and walked away and left it for someone else to sort out. So then the local authority was left with a problem, or uh, Scottish office left with a problem, knocked the buildings down. And this, of course, was before the control of asbestos uh, regulations and before the Environmental Protection Act and the Hazardous Waste Regulations. So in those days, you simply knocked a building down irrespective of what was inside. There could be waste material discarded during manufacture, and again, before these regulations, a lot of fly tipping on sites. So that's where the contamination comes from. The, oops, sorry. sorry. Uh, if there's asbestos in the building when it comes down, or if it's chucked out the back of your factory, and that goes into the ground, once you break a ground, you send in your tractors, your bulldozers, of course, the stuff's going to get airborne. And that's going to be a problem for the health of your workforce on site. That can lead to, if not, if not properly controlled, asbestos-related diseases. And do remember, this year alone, about 5,700 people will die of asbestos-related disease this year. And that is the biggest single industrial killer we have ever, ever seen in the United Kingdom. We've never seen anything like that. And that, of course, was the purpose of uh, Graham's talk uh, last week, the week before, uh, regulation for the duty to manage and everything else. So we have a, prob a potential problem with the health of the workforce. We'll have a real problem with the cost of the project. The cost of asbestos remediation ranges from tens of thousands to tens of millions of pounds. We had one recently which was 30 million pounds, and that's just the cost of remediation alone. And on top of that, we have uh, a time delay. It could be as little as six months, perhaps, usually 12 to 18 months. So if you find, if you buy a piece of land without an asbestos survey, First of all, you're off your head. And if you do that, you could end up spending millions of pounds more than you budgeted for. And the job could take you as long again as you budgeted for. So a real, real problem for us. A problem for, for developers in particular. The first major asbestos uh, soil project in the UK, in the world, especially here in the UK, uh, was here in the west of Scotland. It's expansion of a top secret nuclear submarine base. That's where our frontline submarines are. The hunter killers are there and the big missile carriers are there. 
One of them is always at sea, as you know, carrying nuclear missiles. And that's about 25 miles as a crow flies from where I'm sitting at the moment. It was a time back in 86, uh, the government was moving from uh, Trident nuclear missiles to Polaris nuclear missiles. And the missiles are nearly twice as big. And the carriers are almost twice as big as the Trident uh, carriers. Uh, this is one just going down the Clyde, not far from where I live. You can see armed guards here, uh, whilst the guys are up on deck, uh, going out into the gloom, out into the Atlantic, and nobody, nobody knows where it goes. The Prime Minister, the head of the Navy, and the Captain, and no one else knows where that boat, that boat is going or where it has been. To see one of these close up is amazing. That is half as long again as a football pitch. That's about 150 yards long. It is immense. The problem here, uh, the, the naval base was relatively small. The corporate tridents couldn't cope with Polaris uh, missile carriers. It wasn't big enough. So they bought a piece of land next door, and it was an old shipbreaker's yard. So we have the base, we have the, the Clyde estuary here, going out in, into the Atlantic, of course. So we have the naval base, we have a scrapyard next door, which had closed down. So the Navy bought it and then put in some diggers and said, oh dear, what is this white stuff that we are digging up? And we got called in, the cavalry got called in, and we analysed some samples, and sure enough, it was asbestos. So mass, mass panic. What the hell do we do? There was no guidance from anybody. Nothing like this had been done before at all. So what do we do? Get rid of the asbestos. Great. How do we do it? The asbestos industry was in its first throes then, the, the modern industry. There were no licensed contractors. They didn't exist at this time. There was no information available from the industry, such as it was. There was no information available from the health and safety executive or anybody else. So what on earth do we do? So fortunately, I was at the university then, and I had a little bit of a reputation. I had my own research team, my own research labs, and I got on very well with the university principal, and he just let me alone to get on with things and generate money for him and research grants. So a common sense approach, of course, is to say, there's the base, that's a clean zone, that's a dirty zone. What we'll do is dig up the asbestos contaminated soil and chuck it away can't tell you where it went. Uh, that's covered by the Secrets Act, Official Secrets Act. So conceptually, it's dead easy. Dead easy. You dig it out and you chuck it away. Well, you dispose of it very carefully. In this case, it was chucked away. So <laughs> theoretically, easy. Dig out the contaminant material, dispose of it, certify the land is asbestos free, job done. Easy on a piece of paper. Not so easy when you have 100,000 cubic metres of it. Not so easy because what does asbestos free mean? The job was quite straightforward. You take uh, 100 mil skim, uh, well, test the ground, asbestos, take a skim off it, test the ground. And techniques of analysis are so, so sensitive now, we always found asbestos. So now you take off another 100 mil, test the ground, we find traces of asbestos. Take off another 100 mil, test the ground, find asbestos. And you could go on forever. You could dig a hole to Australia and you will always find tiny, tiny traces of asbestos in the ground. So after about three or four iterations of this, I said, hang on, stop, stop. Every time we do this, it's costing about five or six thousand pounds. So if you carry on doing this over the whole contaminated site, we're going to spend millions and millions and millions just testing soil and getting rid of it. It's preposterous because they're tiny quantities. So I said, what's important is not what's in the soil. What's important is what you breathe in because that gets them into the lung and that's going to give you problems. So I went back to my little lab and put some test rigs and so on and so on because no one knew what the risk was with these tiny quantities of asbestos. So to start with, a simple, a series of quite simple experiments. We built a rig, we had a one meter cube in here, 
uh, made of poo specs. And we had a little funnel in here, and we packed it with asbestos of different concentrations. We had a compressed uh, air bottle over here, a very clever piece of electronics here. So the valve was open for a fixed time, a fixed charge of air, fixed air pressure, everything was fixed. The only variable was the amount of asbestos in the soil. So you press a button, asbestos goes up in the air, we take an air sample, and again, control circumstances, uh, no variables. So the only variable is what's in the soil. So we measured airborne concentration as a function of what's in the soil. And as you'd expect, the more asbestos in the soil, the bigger, uh, the more asbestos you have in the air. Common sense. So we establish a graph in here. And after Graham saw last week, and I'm sure from the work you do, you will know that the site clearance indicator for asbestos work is 0.01 fibres per mil. And that's the lowest level of reliable detection of airborne uh, asbestos fibre concentration. So that's deemed by the HSE as satisfying the asbestos regulations. So we can draw a line across here and see where this cuts in asbestos percent. So if we are working in this region up here, if you disturb the soil with a tractor or whatever, you generate airborne concentrations which are illegal. If you're working in this tiny little bit here, you will generate concentrations which are legal. Tiny, tiny concentrations which are legal. They're below 0 0.01. So we identified a cutoff. That was the first thing. And then we thought, well, I'm on. This translates to something like 0.01% uh, by weight of asbestos in soil, and that's the legal limit still used today. And of course, in most cases, you've got 5%, 10%, 20%, so you're way, way, way up here. So what can we do to control it? It's common knowledge that if you wet uh, soil, then the airborne concentration drops but nobody knew by how much. So we did the same experiment, at this time a fixed charge, a fixed percentage in here, and we added water to it and then blew it up in the air. So now we've got fibers per mil against the percentage water in soil. And again, we, there's a point uh, zero 0.01 fibers per mil level. So if you work up here, you can disturb the soil, you'll always have airborne concentrations below 0 0.01. If you work in this region, you have illegal concentrations, you can't do that. So we identified a critical point of here, and it was about, from memory, about 20-25% 20, by weight of water in the soil. So we've identified a minimum uh, percentage, we've identified, if you're above the minimum percent, we identified how much water you had to put in, and then to finish that off, uh, we have rather a lot of contaminated water. It's a big site. And the Scottish Environment Protection Agency don't like asbestos contaminated water going into the Clyde estuary, which is tidal. The tide comes in, so the tide carries the contaminated water up to the centre of the city. The tide goes out, and you carry asbestos out into the Atlantic. And nobody likes that. So the last thing we did, uh, we set up some experiments and we devised a filtration mechanism in here, a large scale mechanism, of course, for all the water. So now we completed our research work. We know how much weight percent in soil will give negligible risk. If we're above that, as we always are, then we know how much water to put in and we know how to filter the water to minimize the risk of the environment. Pretty damn good. All that was in the lab in, the lab in record time. Uh, and then we put it into practice on, on the commercial site. And it was very, very successful indeed. And we got the job done pretty damn quickly. The job was a complete stop for a few months, but once we started, uh, everything went to plan, came in on a revised budget and so on. Thank you very much, said the Royal Navy. And thank you very much, said the Health and Safety Executive, because this was a model. Can't say too much more about that. But two years later, uh, the Scottish Government a Scottish Development Agency, as it was then, uh, wanted to build a very, very large private hospital uh, near to Glasgow Airport. And the only piece of land available, uh, which was fairly close to the airport, just across the river, a short helicopter hop, uh, that's all. Uh, the problem there, there's the piece of land. Uh, hang on. That's what it looked like. 
Uh, over here was an old shipbreaker's yard. Uh, over here was an old Victorian dock with great big stone walls. And over here, a nice flat piece of land. And combined, this was certainly large enough for a very, very large, very prestigious hospital, which is what's there now. But the problem over here, this was a Turner and Newell asbestos factory, one of the biggest in Europe. Because the biggest shipyards, you need big asbestos factories. It closed down, Turner and Newell walked away, leaving behind the, the structure, leaving behind hundreds of tons of asbestos. They just walked away. The local authority, uh, Dumbarton District Council, uh, made it safe by burying all of the asbestos materials. They dug huge holes and buried it. And that was, I said one of, I think at the time, that was the largest asbestos tip in Europe. So what we've got is a prime piece of land here, apparently a prime piece of land, relatively close to Glasgow city centre, relatively close to Glasgow airport, ideal for purposes, a motorway five minutes away, ideal. But we have this problem of contaminated land. The Syria was here. This was an old Victorian docks, huge, huge stone structure here. Uh, Test boreholes were drilled over here, so we worked out the total volume of uh, asbestos contaminated soil. Uh, we did all the measurements here and the depth in here, and the volume of this was more or less the same as the volume of this. So, okay, why not dig it up? Well, build a, a dam, a coffer dam across here, uh, pump all the water out, line it with geotextile membranes, dig all this up, and put it in here, and then put a cap on top of it. And that was the suggestion, and indeed, that is exactly what happened. We've got, we've established, as we did at Faz Lane, a dirty zone, a clean zone. So the dirty zone was fenced off in here. There's the tips, there's the coffer dam, water pumped out, geotech membranes. A whole road built across there into here. Uh, security fence all the way around. The only way in for people is here. The only way in for vehicles is here. And here we have a clean zone outside the asbestos zone. So the concept was uh, you put vehicles in here, you put diggers in, you put lorries in here. Once they go in, they are there for the duration of the contract. They don't come out at all. At the end of the contract, of course, then all the asbestos is in here, it's sealed, so you can then decontaminate these and bring them out at the end of the contract. Any person going in here is contaminated, they dress like spacemen, of course, and the end of each shift they go through a decontamination unit and come out as normal people. So the concept is, remember the key factor here, because the concentration of asbestos in the soil was pretty damn big, it was 30-40% in parts, way above our safety margin, which meant we had to wet these strips. So we work in a strip perpendicular to the river here. The diggers would go in, the lorry would back up. Well, first of all, we had water bowsers, which went up and down here, up and down there, uh, to make it thoroughly wet, and we tested it. And when it was more than 25% water, okay, boys, you can dig it out. So these guys go in, dig it all out, put it in the back of the truck. The truck trundles around here, reverses, and drops it into, uh, into the big hole in the ground, lined with geotech membranes. So once you've cleared a strip here, then, well, this strip here was cleared first of all, and then we have clean lorries coming from quarries and wherever with clean infill. They drive along here, drop the infill, we've got a clean bulldozer here which uh, pushes it flat, so we fill this with clean infill material. Boulders first of all, uh, and, and then graded soils after that. So the dirty, uh, the dirty vehicles never come out, the clean vehicles never go in, and a strict segregation here. On top of that, we had to put a water sump in, of course, there's lots of water, and we put in a filtration system, and that went out into the River Clyde, and we had boats out here testing the water at the outfall to make sure there's no asbestos in it. We also set up airborne monitoring stations. Uh, the prevailing wind is off the Atlantic, so the prevailing wind is left to right on my diagram here. So we set up samplers upwind, and we set up samplers downwind. We didn't do that on day one. 
and we got badly caught out. The wind came up, and there was all sorts of uh, uh, of, of plant material over here, and uh, we're sampling downwind down here, thinking that was the right thing to do. And if a sample, we we had put we had samples on the perimeter, which is houses about fifty meters away, samples on the perimeter, samples on the driver, samples on the driver. We've got navvies with shovels going here. We've samples on these these guys, and if any sample was above zero point zero one, the lowest level we can detect, a klaxon sounded. Work stopped. Everything stopped. And we went to investigate. So we were about a week into this, and the klaxon went. We measured a sample down here above 0 0.01. Claxton went, all hell broke loose, of course. We couldn't find anything wrong. Everything was done perfectly. And we found up here dandelions. You know, the things as children we used to blow, you know, big head and you blow it and all the little veins uh, go off. Dandelion head down a microscope is a dead ringer for chrysotile, white asbestos. You won't tell the difference between one and the other. So we got the samples, we then did some electron microscopy work on them. They were not asbestos samples at all, they were plant fibres. So from that moment on, we sampled upwind and we sampled downwind. So if you, get, you can get fibres up here, and you get fibres down here, if there's more fibres here, it's coming from your site. So if you are involved in sampling, in remediation of sampling sites, you really have to sample upwind and downwind, not simply downwind. Okay, that was uh, relatively successful. It, look, it looks nice and, nice and plain and simple here. In fact, of course, it's a massive building site. So here's our, our, our tractor units going in. Uh, there's one of the water bowsers. So imagine the water bowser goes up and down, up and down, up and down, makes it saturated. We measure, okay, boys, send in the diggers, send in the lorries. Uh, you get a feel for what it was like. These are the big moxies. So we've got our JCBs in here, digging the stuff out, putting a moxie. The moxie goes up the main road over to the hole in the ground, which is over there. So pretty straightforward, apart from scale. There's one of the moxies there. So I should go back here. Uh, the drivers are all protected. When we first started, they wore big full face protectors like the asbestos uh, removal boys did. And that was very, very dangerous indeed, because in the winter time, the sun is low in the sky and it blinds the drivers here. So there's a, a real, real risk of running over people. Uh, we, didn't, uh, we took over 1,500 samples in our stay there and none of them were above 0 0.01. Other than the one dandelion head, none of the others were. Now that meant we could relax things a bit and give the drivers here just P3 respirators here, perfectly adequate to protect against asbestos. And of course, they can now see and they're not going to run over people. So you got a feel for what the site was like: absolutely massive, dirty, mucky, and everything else. Trivial jobs like a puncture become a major test of resources. Normally, you have a flat tire on a car, you pull over, you phone AA or they phone a, a tire company, along will come a truck, uh, they pump up your, your car, take the wheel off, change the tire, and put a new one back on. Same principle here, exactly. But these two lads now are in an asbestos contaminated zone. So these guys, they're, they're just normal tire people come from a tyre shop somewhere. So we had to train them, first of all, how to put on respirators. We had to have the respirators checked before they could go on site. We had to train them how to put on the PPE and how to take it off. And we had to train them to go through uh, decontamination units because they can put their gear on and walk in, but you can't do that going out. You have to decontaminate. So even a simple job like changing a tyre becomes a major, major logistical exercise. And all jobs became major jobs on that dam site. One or two slides just to finish that off. Uh, and that's what it looked like just at the end of construction. Uh, now all this is, is uh, landscape. It looks very nice now. But there's the brand new hospital. You've got a five-star hotel over there. All of this is landscaped. There is the old Victorian dock over here. 
Uh, when uh, the last of the soil went in, it was capped with a meter of clean topsoil. Uh, then the geotech membrane went on, belt and braces, another uh, half meter of clean topsoil on top of that. And then we got uh, some uh, some garden people to come along and put in uh, short, uh, put in shrubs with short roots which go horizontally. You, know, you don't go down and disturb the geotech mem membrane, they go horizontally. So everything, everything is bound together. So. <clears throat> that uh, has become a, a very prestigious hospital in, um, in in Scotland in general, and west of Scotland in particular. It was built for the private market, uh, which uh, which uh, collapsed. Uh, eventually, it was sold to the Scottish government for one US dollar. Uh, the build cost was one hundred and fifty million pounds sterling, but now a very prestigious organisation indeed. These days, we're a lot further forward now. We know how to do these jobs. My little company, we do it all the time, all the time, all over the country. We know what to do. Uh, we know how to train people. And I've been instrumental in, in all, all, the, all three of these courses. So we have an asbestos awareness uh, course for people who may be exposed to asbestos, plumbers, and which Graham talked about last week. Uh, we have an asbestos in soils overview course. We have an asbestos non-licensable work course, which is what these boys would do on site. It's not licensed work, it's non-licensed work. So we have awareness courses, non-licensable work to allow these, these people to work. The, the awareness for the, the drivers and so on, the moxie drivers. The non-licensable work course for the guys doing the digging and all that. Uh, we have an overview here for the engineers who are going to plan the job and supervise the job and everything else. So we will look after that as Yukata. The employer, of course, must do site-specific RAMs, risk assessment and method statements. And with people with no experience at all, uh, our, our company will come along and, and, and help you write, uh, write those things. And that was it. That was it. If you have any questions, now is the time to answer them, but you have to make them easy. Because my pals are on here and they got missiles and we know your postcodes. So any nasty questions and we're going to send missiles after you. Okay, and that's me done. Bang on time, a minute over, to, over time. Okay, Trish, that's me. Great. Thank you very much, Roger. That was so interesting. And um, you can just see that your experience, you know, you really are talking from from experience. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> we we have a couple of, of questions. Um, and the one is um, would should you be asking for surrounding ground to be covered on a building survey, or is it a special survey? Um, the the it's it's a survey of the land. Uh, and what you should do before you before you do the survey or commission the survey, you might do it as a client. You might ask us to do it, but you will say to me, "Okay, Rog, I'm going to buy this piece of land. I'm going to build flats or whatever I'm going to build." And we would go away. We would look at the land register first of all to see if there's any uh, any historical evidence there. And if there are, there's an old factory there, for example, then you can look at it and you can get, make a pretty good estimate of where the haul roads were and where the waste sites were, you know, and you would sample these sites. Um, it's a good idea to talk to local people. Um, I, I used to have a dog and I used to walk dog around these sites, you know, and inevitably again, contact with some really old guy who lived there for 50 years and he could tell me exactly what was on that site you know for the last 50 years so you need to do these desktop exercises first that's what you need to do so it's not just not just the factory built where the factory building was it's the footprint that you have to look at and then you would sample the footprint a word of warning um, normal soil sampling is not sufficient uh, our first 10 jobs, um, some geotech engineers had been in here with the screws and they dig a hole and take out samples. And out of, out of the first 10 jobs, nine of them did not uncover asbestos. 
And we said, we don't think this is right because we knew what was on the site. So when we go out and sample, or if we commission people to sample, we dig trenches. That's what we do. Okay. So we ident identify from the footprint, you know, where it's likely to be, not just the olfactory unit, but have a good look around, look for vegetation which is stunted or funny colour that tells you there's something bad in the ground, you know. So you do all this desktop exercise and then you dig trenches. So depending on what was there before, you might have to go down half a metre or two metres or whatever it is, you know, depending on what you're going to do. Uh, but we would always advocate trenches, always. Because if we dig a trench, we find it. If we dig boreholes, most times we don't find it. Okay, thank you. We, we have another question here from Ian Bailey. He, he wants to know, is the immediate discovery of asbestos below ground as much of an immediate... Um, sorry, the, the message is flicking over now. <laughs> yeah. Guys are sending I, their questions through. Yeah, I, I, can, just, I can see it here. You've yeah. got the question there, right. Yeah, Would you yeah, be able uh, to answer that? Yeah, the answer is, uh, so, sorry, was the gentleman's name? Ian. Ian, yeah, yes. uh, if you take, remember risk depends on how much asbestos fibres you've got in your lung. That's what it depends on. Uh, and that in turn depends on what's in the atmosphere. So the key to estimating risk is what's in the atmosphere. Now, if you uh, disturb uh, asbestos insulation on a boiler, if you just rip it off dry, you'll get about 600 fibres per mil. At the moment, Ian, you're breathing in less than 0 0.01 fibres. So if you rip asbestos off a boiler, you are now 60,000 times higher than you should be breathing in. And that is damn dangerous. Uh, the soil samples, the maximum we measured dry, the maximum we measured dry before adding the water was about two or three fibres per mil. So 600 fibres per mil from boiler insulation, about two or three uh, from uncovering asbestos in the soil. It'd be a bit higher than that, of course, if you put in a, a, a JCB and just ripped it up. But if you just shovel it up, that's what you're going to get. So there's no comparison between them, really. Much, much lower risk. I hope that's okay, Ian. Roger, the, the other question we have from James Grieg is, I assume dandelion head fibres being organic, therefore not a health hazard like asbestos fibres being inorganic, fortunately. Easy question. Uh, it, it is, yeah, it is. Um, Mavis, please, please forgive me for being oversimplistic here. Uh, <laughs> I know Mavis will be listening to this. Um, asbestos fibres, uh, the paradox is, if you can see things, they're not dangerous. They, 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 they never get past here. The chief engineer, when he designed this, designed very efficient traps up here. So things more than about uh, 100 microns never get past here. They, they trap the pure and you cough it out, you spit it out. Uh, asbestos fibres, if you work on them, they break down with size and they become what we call respirable, typically 10, 20 microns in length and less than one micron in diameter. And these are now small enough to evade the traps. They go right down into the deep lung, into the alveoli, and they trap, they can't get out. But we have a very, very efficient defense mechanism. So a message goes from, uh, from your lung up to your brain. I said, hey, Rog, there's something in my lung. So <laughs> a nice simple picture, the brain sends down what I call chemical stormtroopers. So these will envelop whatever's in the lung, it will dissolve it, and it'll go through the wall of the lung and eventually go down the toilet at some stage. A lovely study done in Sweden about 20 years ago on by the Kaliamaki's husband and wife team. Uh, and they measured iron lung in welders. You know, welders, they have to they face in the weld to see it, of course, and they breathe in iron oxide from the weld. Uh, that goes right down into the deep lung, and the lung literally fills up with iron oxide. Uh, and that's called iron lung. Uh, <clears throat> but what they did, they plotted uh, the amount of iron in a welder's lung as a function of years of work, and it goes up. Obviously, it just goes up. What was clever, they measured it as a function of years of retirement, and it drops exponentially. 
So it peaks the day they finish work, then it drops exponentially. And over about five, six, seven years, there's almost no iron left in the lung. Now that's the natural scavenging mechanism, which is working. Because iron is easy to get rid of. You put your car out in the rain for long enough, it'll dissolve, it'll go rusty and dissolve. So iron is easy to get rid of. But there's a perfect example of the scavenging mechanism at work. So if you breathe in one of these dandelion heads, uh, your single vein skein of it is small enough, you hear the traps, goes right down into the deep lung, stormtroopers come down, gone. Okay. Right, next question is from Stuart Strathy, and he asks, 4SC, statement of cleanliness at the end of the job. Uh, four stage clearance of ah right. Uh, the four stage clearance is a very specific test at the end of an asbestos removal job. Um, there's part of the asbestos regs. You have to stop the spread of asbestos, and the way we do that, if you've got a boiler, you're going to take the lagging off the boiler. You build a polythene tent around that that boiler. Heavy duty 1000 gauge polythene, that is under negative air pressure. So the sides should buckle in, you know. Uh, so that if someone drops a Stanley knife or an accident, uh, you don't have uh, contaminated air going out, you have clean air coming in because it's under negative pressure. There's all sorts of other bits, but, but conceptually, it's all you need to know. Now, if you build an enclosure before the enclosure can come down, it has to be tested. Like people like us. It used to be you just went along, you had a good look inside the enclosure. If it was clean, dust free, then you said, okay, I'll take some air tests. And if they're below 0 0.01, you say, okay, boys, take down the enclosure. And you hand the area back to the client. All sorts of problems with that. So we moved from that to a four stage process. So we would go, my staff would go on site and they'd find the, the project manager uh, or site manager and say, okay, what was your job here? My job was to remove all the ceiling tiles in the school gymnasium. Okay, have you done it? Have you completed it? Yes. Okay, so then you go in, you inspect, make sure there's no dust or debris. And if that's okay, then you do the, the third bit. Uh, which is the airborne me measurement. And if they're all below 0 0.01, then you can say, okay, folks, take down the enclosure, but you wait there on site. And once the enclosure is gone, then you can, you can inspect what was underneath the enclosure. You can inspect the whole route from the enclosure to the skip, you know, where all, all the waste went and everything else. So in, in modern asbestos industry, that's called a four stage clearance. But you always have to have a four-stage clearance if you build an enclosure. The other side of the coin uh, is, uh, the other part of the question is a statement of cleanliness. Now, that's used if you take off Artex, for example. In most cases, you don't need to build an enclosure. Uh, you can use gels, put gels on the Artex, that dissolves it, and you gently scrape it off, you know. So at the end of that, the contractor who, who did the work, uh, he would carefully visually inspect. Uh, it's not a legal requirement to take an air sample, which I don't agree with, but who am I? Uh, so they do a visual inspection, and then they would complete this certificate of cleanliness which tells the client or the homeowner that the job has been done, it's been inspected, and there is no dust or debris there. So it, it, it's a much, much lower threshold. Um, nothing wrong with that, because risk from Artex is pretty small. The risk to the household is negligible. Uh, the risk is to the pe people putting on the Artex, or particularly taking off the Artex regularly. That's where the risk is. So quite a different level of risk, you know. Okay. Another easy question for you, Roger. When digging the trench, should we assume the presence of asbestos from a health and safety perspective? Uh, it depends on your desktop analysis. It depends. Uh, if you have uh, reasonable grounds for suspicion, yes, you should. Uh, if you've done your desktop and it's, you know, there, there is there are no grounds for suspicion at all. It's up to you, really. Uh, personally, uh, I would. 
personally, I, if, you know, when we're commissioning this work, if we're on site doing site supervision and we've got a lad at the JCB, we would say to them, okay, put on uh, a Tyvek Type 5 coverall uh, and put on a P3, just in case. So it's not mandatory. I think, I personally think it's good practice. Right, next question would be from Anthony Ferris. Um, could you explain further why the vast majority of soil site removal is non-licensed, as yeah. most presume wrongly it is licensed work? Um, yeah, this is a little bit more difficult to explain. Um, the work is non-licensed if you can prove that when you disturb whatever you're doing, uh, the airborne concentration is less than uh, 0 0.1 fibers per mil, not 0 0.01, which is the clearance indicator, uh, is 0 0.1 fibers per mil. That's the point at which the HSE risk, uh, thinks that risks become, risk becomes unacceptable. So if you go above 0 0.1 fibers per mil, then the work is notifiable. Uh, the people become asbestos re removal contractors and they have to have um, medical examination. You have to keep the records of wherever it is, 30 years and so on. So it's a big deal. But if you can keep that airborne concentration below 0 0.1 fibers per mil, then it's not licensable work. And it's not just soil, that's anything. That's anything at all, you know. Uh, and we showed absolutely conclusively at Faz Lane and again at the Golden Jubilee Hospital, you know, 1,500 samples. We had JCBs digging up the ground, for God's sake. But it was properly wetted, it was properly controlled, and we didn't have a single sample above 0.01. That's 10 times lower uh, than the 0.1 limit. So that, that, that's the reason it comes down to the definition of, of what licensable work is. All right. Okay, another question we have is uh, from Siona Carroll. Do you think asbestos in soils is becoming a disproportionate risk? For example, single sample found on non-industrial land with no history. Um, land is now contaminated. How do we manage this very emotive issue, particularly if uh, didn't? Yeah. Uh, I feel very, very strongly about this. Um, this came to a head in Scotland a few years ago. Uh, our environment agency up here is called SIPA, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, which is the equivalent of your environment agency down south. Uh, and they had two young graduates join them, um, straight from university, no experience. Uh, they were sent out on some job or other. And they came across some fly tipping uh, on some farmland. And you know, you know the corrugated uh, asbestos cement roofs, you know, barns and warehouses. Uh, there were about three or four of these sheets just chucked in a field. Um, they went back to their headquarters. I, I, I know the health and safety manager very, very well indeed. Uh, first I knew of it, I got a phone call from Brian and he said, I have two uh, very upset young ladies in here. They're in my office, they're crying, they think they're going to die. I said, what the hell has happened, Brian, thinking the worst? And they'd gone into this field, someone had complained. They'd opened the gate, walked into the field, over to see what was there. It was asbestos cement, they didn't touch it, and they fled back to the office. Uh, they wanted their clothes bagged, which Sipa agreed to. They had to buy them new clothes. Uh, the uh, boards they were carrying, the paper, they had all that destroyed because they thought they were going to die. And that goes back to this nonsense of one single fibre kills. Now, lots of people, I suspect, in the audience today have heard me speak about real risk and perceived risk. You know, the perceived risk, you breathe in one fibre and you're going to die. Asbestos is so dangerous, you look at it from 200 yards and you'll be dead tomorrow. Now, in practice, uh, that is not the case. I, I'm, I'm not saying asbestos is, is not dangerous. I'm not saying that at all. If you work with it, I worry terribly. If you work with it regularly, I really do. But we had a, one of my legal cases a few years ago, now seven or eight years ago, 
uh, the lad uh, had worked in the shipyards. He was diagnosed with mesothelioma. Now, at that point, his medical opinion is probably correct, but it's opinion. That's what it is. And then, sometime later, the poor lad passed away. Uh, an autopsy was done, and mesothelioma was confirmed. Uh, there's a test that you can do, and that confirms it. So now, medical opinion becomes medical fact. We had some of the biopsy material, and we sent it to Professor Gibb down in Penarth, near Cardiff, the old pneumoconiosis research unit down there. And he did some clever work with electron microscopes. Conceptually, it's dead simple. You take a slice of the lung, you put it on a microscope, and you count how many fibres you see. And then you could scale it up. So you get a ballpark figure, you know. And that's what he did. The clever bit, of course, with his microscope, a million quid, whatever it was. But conceptually, it's a very, very simple experiment. So he did that, and he reported back 102 million asbestos fibres in that lad's lung. So we have confirmed mesothelioma. We have a simple scientific experiment, over 100 million fibres. And that's been done in different laboratories in different countries by different people. And we always get about 100 million fibres. So I think it's preposterous that people are still talking about one fibre kills when we've got good scientific evidence. That is not the case. So now I, I sat down with these two young ladies uh, and explained uh, there's a lot more background science to, to, to go with it. We haven't got time today. Uh, so we call them right now, right down at the end of it. One of them burst out laughing and she's, oh, she said, I feel such a fool. But that's what she was taught at university. She had a degree in biology. And what do they know about anything? So she was told at university, you breathe in one fiber, you're going to die. And I have people coming on my courses and say, oh, well, I went on a course last year in Edinburgh or something. And they told me one, one, one fiber, you're going to die. I was down in Newcastle recently talking to a big electrical supply company. And all their staff have been, have been trained. And they've all been taught one fiber kills. And it is not correct. So I see nothing wrong with picking up little bits of, of, of broken material. If it's cement or even AIB, the fibers are locked into the matrix. It's cement, for God's sake. The fiber is in there as a stiffener to keep the shape of the wave, you know? That's why it's there. You can't get the fibers out You got it, it, in big quantities. You'd have to attack it with a still saw to get any, any meaningful fiber levels out of it. So I see it, nothing wrong whatsoever in picking up a little piece of asbestos cement and putting a poly bag. I see nothing wrong with that. I'd have huge troubles if you took a still saw to a garage roof and cut it off. <laughs> I'd have huge problems with that, but not picking up tiny quantities. On to our next question from Deborah Telford. With regards to the reuse of soils on site, have you seen more projects considering the screening or picking of fragments from the soils? For example, yeah. conveyor belt setup? Yeah, yeah. We, 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 have, we have been involved in these, uh, in, in these uh, and they're very effective. Uh, to move back one, to get rid of asbestos contaminated soil is very, very, very expensive. Uh, I don't, it'll vary around the country, of course, but in the west of Scotland, uh, I think it's £185 per lorry load. And that's a gate price. And on top of that is the cost of the haulage. And there are only two landfill sites in the whole of Scotland which will take asbestos contaminated soil. Two. One, uh, one is in uh, Glasgow, on the outskirts of the city, and one is in Ayrshire, about 20 miles away. So if you were up in, I don't know, Thurso, up where the nuclear reactor is up there, and you're going to get rid of some asbestos contaminated soil, you'll go to the back of a truck in Thurso, eight, nine hours later, it'll arrive in Glasgow, and you've got to pay all those haulage fees. It's a long way to Thurso from Glasgow. <laughs> a long, long way. So the haulage fees are a big, uh, cost of this gate price is big, so you can spend tens of thousands on getting rid of soil from uh, from a site, hundreds of thousands even. So we, if you go back to the asbestos legislation, asbestos contaminated soil is uh, is a, a a two a twin decision. 
You take a sample of soil, if you can see asbestos debris in it, like little bits, then legally that asbestos contaminated soil. If you can't see bits in it, then you take a sample, you show it under a microscope, uh, you might see finely divided fibres in there. If the total weight percent of the fibres is less than 0.1% by weight, legally it's not asbestos contaminated. So you can put it in a normal landfill site. So what you can do is exactly what, uh, is it Deborah? Uh, yeah, Deborah. It's exactly what Deborah just said. Uh, you can set up, well, you have to look at your soil first of all to see if it's going to be sensible or not. Uh, and then you can put it on these conveyor belts. You've got to hand pick all the debris coming out of it. And then on the end of the conveyor belt, you've got clean, in inverted commas, you've got clean soil coming off. So then, of course, you'd have to sample that clean soil to make sure it's less than 0.1% by weight. Uh, if it is, then you can reuse it or you can send it to normal landfill sites, do what you like. But huge cost savings, huge. We, we did have one site, a city centre site, a developer from London had bought the site unseen. Uh, it was very close to Glasgow University, a prime site uh, to build halls of residence. There's a lot of money in halls of residence just now um, for the university. So he bought this unseen, the first day on site, white stuff in the soil. So he got some quotes and he was quoted three million pounds to remediate the site. Three million. And he couldn't afford it. He'd already paid millions for the site anyway and he couldn't afford it. So the job was on complete stop. Uh, he asked around, around the city, the engineers and the architects, and they said, go and see Roger's team. Um, he's a bit expensive, but he's bloody good. <laughs> So they came to us and we had the whole job done for about a uh, hundred thousand pounds, all of it. And an important part was exactly what Deborah said there. Because when we had a close look at the soil, there were lots of fragments in it in relatively clean soil. So it was very cost effective in that case to set up a conveyor belt and hand pick and, and screen. It can be very, very efficient, very effective indeed. Okay, okay, Deborah, I hope that's okay. Roger, there's another question from Andrew Griffin asking, in your experience, what has been the best option when asbestos in soils has been identified to a level that is sufficient to make the soil hazardous waste to try and filter the soil of ACMs to reduce the concentration using plant and labor so that the soil can be classed as stable, non-reactive, or to yeah. simply dispose of the soil as hazardous waste? Uh, it's basically the same answer. As I same just answer, given. yes. Yeah, it's the same answer, really. Right. Uh, you, you can certainly do you, you have to have a look at the soil first and make a value judgment. And you know, if it's really badly contaminated, lots of fines in it, you know, then you've got no option, really. You have to get rid of it. Whereas if there's a lot of quite large debris in it, you know, hand pick it, take it out for God's sake, and then have a look at what's left. So it's the same answer, really. Right. I have to smile at this comment from Gordon. Uh, he says, I'm ex sepa myself and would yeah. say that in the day, it'll only kill you if it falls on your head or try to smoke it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that comment. <laughs> yeah, you can smoke it, okay? No, no problem. <laughs> well, you can't actually because it won't burn. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question from Jonathan Ford last, about licensed work on soil, soil sites, not just the control limit compliance, but also the type of ACM in the soils when clearly identifiable original form. Spray coating, lagging, or AIB is present. I wouldn't say that's really a question. It's obviously a, a topic you would like to expand on. I'm not quite sure I understand what the question is. Could, could yeah. you repeat it, please? So it's, it's about licensed work on soils yeah. 
not just the control limit compliance, but also the type of ACM in the soils when clearly yeah. identifiable original yeah. form. I, I, think that's a, I think that's a little misunderstanding because if you look carefully at the asbestos regulations, when, when, when we teach this in asbestos awareness, we always say that you cannot work on asbestos insulation. You can't. Um, you may be able to work on asbestos insulating board. You can work on asbestos cement. Uh, and that, that's what we teach people. But if you go into it, in, in, uh, and that's really to keep people out of harm's way, out of risk. Um, if you look at the regulations and read them very carefully, you are actually allowed to work on asbestos insulation as long as you don't exceed the control limit. So it doesn't matter if it's insulation in the soil or if it's loose fibers or if it's cement or if it's board. As long as you can work on that soil and not exceed the control limit, you can do it. It's an unlicensed contractor. And you can do that, of course, by you, you, using uh, using water sprays, uh, as I described. Hmm. Right. So Jonathan was saying it wasn't a question. He was just commenting. Um, yeah. Do you see if we could clarify on one of your earlier responses? So I think um, Jonathan does that answer or, or explain everything to you. Oh, I've got his question. I think we, we have come to the end of our questions. Um, we'll just wait for, for Jonathan to reply there. And um, right, so Jonathan says regulation two says only to work on lagging ARB if in good condition and for short duration otherwise licensed work? No, short duration is defined. Well, short duration is undefined in terms of time. That, 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 that's, that's been a source of contention since the regs were published. And if you look in detail at what HSEs say, their, their definition is, is less than the control limit. And, and you can do that with asbestos insulation. As long as you do it carefully, as long as you in soils, you put water in it. Uh, you can even do it with insulation if you inject it and stuff like that. Okay, I, I, I think we've come to the end of our session. Um, it's really been interesting and we've had a lot of interaction. So thank you everybody um, for that. Um, and obviously to Professor Willie for your time, your valuable time. Um, on behalf of SMAS WorkSafe and Yukata, may we take this opportunity to wish you and yours a wonderful Christmas and a very, very happy new year. The recording will be made available on social media such as LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter, or you can go to our website at www.smasltd.com. Um, and we will also be sending out, or should I say, Yukata, Debbie from Yukata, um, sends a copy of the link to all registrants. <clears throat> so thank you very much to everybody. We'll say goodbye. Okay, goodbye. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.